please join me in welcoming Dr. Resnick. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me as we move through this presentation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight, and we're going to discuss some of the basics about oral health and HIV disease, specifically on oral manifestations of the disease. Um, I have to make a disclosure statement. I'm actually not going to be talking about any products that I have any relation with for this educational activity. Uh, we're going to talk about the latest trends in oral manifestations, and there's actually a reason for that. There are several publications that I've been involved with in, uh, in one form or another, and people were sort of stuck on what we saw maybe back in the early part of the 90s and not where we are today. We're going to discuss the most um, common oral lesions seen in association with HIV disease and even talk about some of the clinical management issues that, that you might face in the dental office. So let's just go to the basics. Um, at the beginning of this epidemic, uh, almost everybody, up to 90% of, of people who were infected with HIV or people living with AIDS would present with an oral lesion during the course of their disease state. That's actually changed quite significantly. Um, there are several studies which I've quoted under there. The, the latest I'm actually going to talk a little about, the one that was published in 2011, and, and maybe to help those um, with some of the abbreviations, uh, I'm using C-ART, which is combination antiretroviral therapy in, in this particular slide. So we went from a, a significant population where we had maybe 47 to 85 percent of people presenting with at least one oral manifestation to now where it's really somewhere between 32 and 46 percent. So we still are seeing all of the things that we saw earlier in the epidemic and we're seeing a few things that are, are new or maybe a little bit new or at least the amount that, that we're seeing. Um, but not to the same degree. So not every patient that comes into the program that, that I work in, and we have uh, 5,200 people with advanced HIV disease at Grady Health Systems Infectious Disease Program. So they all don't present with oral lesions. <clears throat> what are some factors that might predispose a person to present with uh, an oral lesion? The top two are actually the most important. A CD4 count of less than 200, which by definition is, is an AIDS-defining condition, and a viral load that's greater than 3,000 copies. Other factors that actually play into this include xerostomia or dry mouth, poor oral hygiene, and smoking. And I'll actually talk a little bit about smoking in, in our presentation. If we look at some of the trends that were published by colleagues of mine, um, the Greenspans from UCSF and, and Tim Hodgson's from, from the UK, we actually saw a decrease in frequency in oral lesions early following, actually following the, the initiation of, of antiretroviral therapy, the combination therapy. There's some evidence saying that antiretroviral therapy does play a role in reducing the occurrence and actually the virulence of candidiasis, and that it's mostly to do with the, the uh, regimens that contain protease inhibitors. We're not exactly sure on the impact of antiretroviral therapy on other, uh, certain other lesions. Some, such as aphthous ulcers, are very common in the general population, and we do see aphthous ulcers in people living with HIV disease. There has been an increased <coughs> prevalence of oral warts, excuse me, <coughs> of oral warts um, since heart that was highly active antiretroviral therapy from both the U.S. and the U.K., We've seen an increased incidence of HIV-related salivary gland disease. You might see people that have sort of looks like puffy parotid glands, and that's in the U.S. and in Europe. There's a possible, but not proven, a possible association between an increased risk of oral squamous cell carcinoma and HIV disease as well. The one study that I'm going to touch on a little bit was actually from colleagues and friends of mine at UAB in, uh, in Birmingham. At their 1917 clinic, they looked at 744 patients over a two-year period of time, and during that two-year period of time, they found that 35 percent, a little bit, a little bit more than 35 percent, presented with at least one oral lesion during that two-year period of time. The most prevalent uh, lesion that they saw was oropharyngeal candidiasis. So their conclusions were we still are seeing oral lesions in the uh, combination antiretroviral therapy now that this is more of a chronic disease. 
and there are some tricks about them that might be important. What does it mean when you see them? And hopefully we'll get into that a little bit. I did want to touch on smoking because smoking is something that we, uh, smoking cessation is very important for this patient population as smoking is the uh, major modifiable death risk factor for people living with HIV disease. And it's current smoking. It's not necessarily past smoking, but current smoking tripled the death risk factor. That was from one study. A separate study, there we go, a separate study um, looked at that 40.5% were current smokers and 24.8% were former smokers compared to never smokers, uh, never smokers looking at health risks for current smokers were higher for overall mortality, cardiovascular disease, and pneumonia. So it's important that we don't forget about smoking cessation, that we either uh, practice it as a part of a dental program or in, in our case we actually have a center for well-being in um, our program so we can actually refer them upstairs. So oral manifestations, that's why I think people have joined this talk and we're going to get into that now. There are no oral manifestations that are diagnostic of HIV disease. So if someone presents with something like candidiasis, this is pseudomembranous candidiasis, um, there could be other states that could cause it. This could be due to an uncont uncontrolled diabetes, which I actually see quite frequently now in my clinic. It could be due to using a steroid uh, containing asthma inhaler. Uh, there's some, um, I've never seen a case of a broad spectrum antibiotic causing candidiasis, but there are reports of that, um, systemic steroids, etc. And in Atlanta, we're suffering our worst pollen season ever, and asthma is pretty high, so we're really on the lookout to make sure that, that our patients who are on these asthma inhalers, that we make sure they rinse out after using them. For people living with HIV disease, not yet on therapy. There are some communities in the country, such as San Francisco, which have a test and treat mentality and making, are making antiretroviral therapy available to everybody almost as soon as they are diagnosed and are ready to start. In, in my state, we actually have a waiting list, a waiting list for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Actually, I think, uh, regretfully, it's the largest in the country. Um, the good news I can say about that is that the, uh, these patients are actually not doing without medication due to patient assistance programs. But the current recommendations, uh, you wouldn't start above 500 in, in a place like Georgia or most places in the U.S. You, the recommendations are starting somewhere between 350 or around 500. So if you have someone who's tested positive, they have a relative high CD4 count, you see them on a regular basis, um, if you see certain oral manifestations, they might actually signal disease progression. So for instance, this is a slide of erythematous candidiasis. If you rule out other causes for having erythematous candidiasis and you're on the dental side, then you need to rule them to primary care. If you're on the primary care side, you need to be able to identify what this lesion is, know what labs you need to get, and of course go ahead and treat. And then for persons living with HIV disease on any retroviral therapy, the presence of certain oral lesions may, signi may signify a failure in therapy, and that's actually key. Uh, the lesion I'm showing you here is called oral hairy leukoplakia, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But oral hairy leukoplakia needs, um, which is related to Epstein-Barr virus, needs to have actually a, a detectable viral load for it to present. So you're not going to see this lesion in a person who has an undetectable viral load. So this is an idea where in my practice if I see this and I actually you know, refer them right upstairs and we actually facilitate care for this patient. How does this actually work in the real world? I'm going to talk about this one lady. She's a 42-year-old African-American female who came to Oral Health Center's name of the part of the clinic that I run. In April of 07, she was diagnosed in 1999 with a nadir with a low CD4 count of 13. Uh, at this visit, she says health is with normal limits, no new symptoms. She spent most of the time talking about a mutual friend. At that point, the, the therapies were a little bit more toxic. She was tired of taking the medications. Her primary care provider had tried to talk her out of stopping her medications. Very strong willed, very beautiful woman. And come, excuse the language, come hell or high water, she was going to have a holiday from her medications during the holidays. Her last CD4 count taken early in, in uh, November was greater than um, 450. She was doing well. And donde is, oh, here it comes. She came to the oral health center for routine hygiene visit. Again, there's, she says there's no changes to her general health and well-being. When we looked into her mouth, this is what we saw. 
a pretty significant case of pseudomembranous candidiasis. So we knew that, that her disease had progressed along pretty quickly. Again, one of the advantages that I have working in the oral health center is that I'm, I'm actually with primary care providers. We're a one-stop shop, so everything is under uh, the one large roof, one big building. And so we took her new CD4 count in April of 07. Her CD4 count had dropped to 43. We did work with her primary care provider and we have nurse educators to get her back on therapy. However, we caught it in time. She did end up in the hospital with a mild case of pneumocystis pneumonia. However, had we not caught it, maybe we wouldn't have caught it in time. Maybe she wouldn't have uh, had such a fine outcome where she's still a patient of mine today. So there are three common presentations of candidiasis that we see among people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, again, none of these are diagnostic of, of HIV disease. None are only seen in this condition, but we do see them quite frequently. The first is angular chelitis. It presents as a cracking or a fissuring at the corners of the mouth. Um, uh, there, are, as I said, HIV is one cause. Um, there are dental causes that can cause this, such as a, a loss of vertical dimension of occlusion when your mouth starts to overclose a little bit. If you're in a cold environment, which gratefully we didn't have this year in Atlanta, um, and you lick your lips on a cold winter day, that can happen. I actually had a, a, a serious dental procedure about 10 years ago, and this slide might be, what I looked like was much, much worse than this, and that was just from uh, manipulation in the dental office. Uh, treating this is using a topical antifungal cream or ointment. Um, I would recommend, um, I would actually recommend using a ketoconazole to present cream applied directly to the lesion uh, four times a day and we'll discuss for how long in a moment. So this is angular chelitis. Again, we see it in older people, we see it in people with HIV, oncology patients, we see it in the general population. We just see it more in people who do have HIV disease. The other one I'd like to talk about is erythematous candidiasis, which is probably the most overlooked um, oral lesion that we see in association with HIV. It presents as a red, flat, subtle lesion, um, either on the dorsal surface of the tongue and or the hard palate. Patients will complain that their mouth burns or their tongue burns, especially when having salty or spicy foods or acidic beverages such as orange juice or grapefruit juice. This is a kissing lesion, so if you see a lesion on the dorsal surface of the tongue, take a look up at the hard palate and see if you see a matching lesion. In this case, there are other things that this might look like. For instance, this might look similar to some people like pizza burn, which I guess all of us have done at one point or another. However, pizza burn is going to be self-limiting. It's going to clear up in a couple days, whereas erythematous candidiasis, either you need to treat the manifestation or address what the underlying condition would be. In most cases, you would need to do both. So it's a red, flat lesion caused by the same organisms that cause the pseudomembranous candidiasis, what we commonly refer to as thrush, but again, it's overlooked. Um, something like this could also possibly appear to be a traumatic lesion of the soft palate, but again, you need to look throughout the oral cavity for these red, flat, subtle lesions. Patients do complain about symptoms. Um, and as far as treatment goes, since it's usually self-limiting, I, I always recommend using a topical therapy unless the patient is not able to comply or with, with the, the number of times you have to use the topical medications. Uh, so that's the erythematous form of candidiasis. Um, again, you can do a KOH prep. You might see some blastospores and a few pseudohyphae, but for the most part, you go by symptoms alone, just by looking at the patient's underlying medical history and the clinical presentation. I like to break up pseudomembranous candidiasis by the extent of disease, not how many T cells somebody has or what their viral load is, and, and that's based on how I plan on treating. So the first I'm going to talk to is about mild to moderate disease. I hope there we go. And that's where you have a uh, disease where a topical is actually going to be able to work. Topical antifungal therapies work by coming into contact with the candidal plaques and disrupting cell function. So the topicals actually have to be able to get in touch with, in touch with the lesion. So if, if it's further back in the posterior oropharynx, topical really isn't going to work and you would need to use a systemic therapy. So here's our first question on treating of candidiasis, and I think we all get to play on this one. Um, treatment of candidiasis, how long should it be? Should, um, except the problem is I can't see the question now. 
Let's see if I can move that. Uh, I can only see B, so I'll talk. There we go. Treatment should continue until the symptoms of candidiasis are gone, which is actually three to, or to seven days. Treatment of candidiasis should be for 10 days. Treatment of candidiasis should last for two weeks. The answer depends on whether a topical or a systemic antifungal therapy is used. So please take your time and, and fill out the answer and let's see what, what people say. Can I get that full screen back? I, I, can't, I can't see all the answers. I can see eight of them so far. Maybe if I click myself, I see. There we go. So we got some shy people who aren't answering. The, you, you're, this isn't a test. You don't get a grade on this. <clears throat> but I will tell you, so we have six people saying three to seven days. We've got three people who are saying it should be for two weeks. Four people, it says it depends on whether it's top, whether you use a topical or a systemic. So I, I, would, I would hope to say that three people have either heard my lecture in the past or three people are very well informed because the answer is the treatment should last for two weeks. That is actually the correct answer. The reasoning behind this is we want to get the colony forming units reduced as much as possible to help prevent recurrence. So although the symptoms might be gone in three days or five days, we do want to get the colony forming units down as low as possible. So treatment should always go for two weeks. And please don't hesitate to send me questions because I do talk fast even if I am from the South. So mild to moderate erythematous or pseudomembranous candidiasis, I have two of the most common agents that are used on your screen. Clotrimazole uh, does have a brand name, it's Mycelex, um, and you dispense 70, it's dissolved one in the mouth five times a day for that two week period of time. The other is Nystatin, which is the most commonly prescribed uh, topical used for treating a candidiasis. I have a few issues with um, Nystatin that I'd like to talk about. The first is, um, um, the answer to the question that popped up is that only for HIV patients or for anybody with candidiasis. Anyone who presents with candidiasis, whether it's a diabetic, oncology patient, with oral candidiasis, treatment should last for two weeks. I hope that got that question. My issues with Nystatin are, are a, few, a few fold. Uh, in many places around the country, the number one unmet need for people living with HIV and AIDS is access to dental care. And we are seeing a great deal of dental disease when people do present to our programs. Nystatin is a 50% sucrose suspension, so it has a high sugar content. Um, they actually came out with a sugar-free form of, of Nystatin. I, I tasted it at an Association of Nurses and AIDS Care conference several years ago. Uh, that there's a reason that there's so much sugar because the taste was pretty awful. Um, and if you have an old PDR hanging around and you look up Nystatin suspension, it'll actually say that you need to swish this four times a day but for five minutes. Now if you look at how it's prescribed, it says as long as possible. And in today's um, blackberrying, typing, texting, twittering world, as long as possible is a very short period of time. Um, so if you don't, and as I mentioned earlier, the way these medications work is by, by being in contact with the plaques and disrupting cell function. So if somebody swishes around with Nystatin for 30 seconds or so and swallows it, they're really not going to have a great benefit. My other issue with Nystatin is it says to swish and swallow. Um, since it doesn't say in contact, if anybody's ever seen a swallowing study, you'll see that, the, that anything that you swallow goes down the esophageal pack. It goes real fast. So it's not going to have, um, it, it's not going to have uh, any kind of benefit by swallowing it. So uh, there's no reason to swallow it. If I am forced to use it, I do have people rinse as long as possible and then to spit the stuff out. It does cause GI distress. There's a question, that, that, that's a question or a statement that, have I tried magic mouthwash with Nystatin? I don't use uh, magic mouthwash. Um, and uh, we can talk about that for a second. Uh, to me, Magic Mouthwash has a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and um, there are some has some forms of uh, Magic Mouthwash do have Nystatin in them, some have Benadryl in them, some have something that's going to hold it together, uh, like a Maalox kind of thing. Um, there might be uh, other, other things in, in your Magic Mouthwash uh, components. But then again, it's not going to be able to be on contact with the plaques long enough. If you're worried about pain, 
um, which is why a lot of times Magic Mouthwash is written, and I can and say the name of this product, There's because I don't work for them or have any relation, there is a product called Gel Clair, G-E-L-C-L-A-I-R. It is a prescription uh, mouthwash uh, that you, actually comes in these packets. They're about yay big. You would actually squeeze the packet into a little, um, like a little glass, you dilute it with one to two tablespoons of water, you, have, you mix it around, you have the patient swish with it for at least a minute and then expectorate and don't have them eat for at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes. This gel clear is actually indicated for treating mucositis. It is a wonderful product. It's basically sort of like a gold standard as far as, as dealing with uh, oral pain due to ulcerations, oral pain due to um, not something like candidiasis, but when you're really dealing with a large oral ulcer or you're dealing with an oncology patient. So I, I'm not the biggest fan of, of, of the Magic Mouthwash products because I, I, I sort of put it this way, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, and, and to me there's not a great deal of magic. That's just a personal opinion, but I think gel clear will help you. If there's mild sensitivity that you're dealing with, um, there is another product which is sort of diluted gel clear, very diluted gel clear called Rinsenol, which actually does help with some oral discomfort. Um, it's something that I sort of hand out as an over-the-counter product, but I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of Magic Mouthwash nor Nystatin. The problem with Clotrimazole, the problem with Clotrimazole is it's five times a day for that two-week period of time. So getting people to actually do something five times a day for two whole weeks is a real challenge, and again, in today's society. The question that popped in here, would gargling with an Nystatin have added benefit in addition to swishing? It couldn't hurt, because um, you're not swallowing it. Um, but if the plaques are that far back that you're trying to actually get something in the posterior oropharynx that might look like this or might look like that, it's not going to stay in contact with the gargle long enough to actually disrupt cell function. But I wouldn't be opposed to having somebody gargle with the cell as long as there really is no reason to swallow it. The, the cases I just sort of showed you to make that point, these cases are what I would consider to be too, much, too, too, too great too much of an extent to use a topical. You need to use a systemic medication. And here again is another example where the plaques just aren't going to be, the medication won't be in contact with the plaques and the posterior oropharynx on the uvula long enough to actually have the desired effect. So here we use systemic therapies and there are two I've listed. The most common and, and uh, by far the most used is fluconazole which is take two on the first day and then one for the rest of that two uh, week period of time. Uh, Vorconazole really should be um, saved for people who have azole resistant candidiasis, something that was very common throughout the 90s. Um, still see some of it today, not nearly as much, um, which is an issue. Part of the issue is we still have a lot of patients who are coming in um, very late to treatment. I think one of the latest studies said that 38.3% of the people who tested positive, I believe, in, in 2008 had an AIDS-defining condition or illness by 2009. So we know it takes a period of time to get there, so we're still not getting people into care fast enough. Fluconazole um, has minimal drug interactions, minimal side effects. It's a very effective medication. And earlier in the epidemic, when people were when HIV was uh, to many uh, a death sentence, uh, there were a lot of people who were given these uh, non-ending prescriptions of fluconazole. Can fluconazole be used with patients on anticoagulant therapy? Um, I'm sure that it can be used in patients with anticoagulant therapy, but I would contact a PharmD to, to work that out or, or look at if there needs to be a dose adjustment because I, I, I'm not a PharmD, I can't answer that question there. Uh, uh, back to where I was, which I actually sort of lost my own train of thought. Um, people were given a lot of fluconazole in the old days, and we've actually seen a change in what causes candidiasis over the years. Uh, when I was a student, which was a long, long time ago, um, you would say that around 98, 99% of all candidiasis were caused by candida albicans. That's actually not the case today. Uh, more recent studies are showing that albicans is responsible for more like 60 to 70%, and we've seen a increase in some of the non-albican species. Um, before I get there, I will talk a little bit about esophageal candidiasis, and you don't have to have such an obvious picture to figure out that a person has esophageal symptoms. 
For an HIV patient who has esophageal candidiasis, their chief complaint is that they feel like things are sticking, that food is sticking or their pills are sticking, they're having a hard time swallowing. For an oncology patient, there is going to be a greater degree of pain because of mucositis and candida species growing over it. So in HIV patients, you might not have the pain component that you see in oncology patients, but you will have patients complain that my food is sticking, I feel like I can't swallow right, I'm having difficulty swallowing. Oncology patients will have a little bit more uh, symptoms. Treating this uh, with someone with HIV, you would use uh, 400 milligrams of fluconazole on day one, and then 200 milligrams for the rest of that two-week period of time. So you're basically doubling the dose. This is an example of azole-resistant candida albicans. It's much harder to remove. It's actually sort of gets, uh, there was, we used to actually refer to this as almost a hyperplastic form of candidiasis because it does have, um, bad Sabrina, it does have a little keratin over it. It's much harder to remove. Um, but this is azole resistant candidiasis. Just because someone is resistant to, um, uh, 100 milligrams doesn't mean they're completely resistant to the drug itself. You can actually increase uh, the amount of the drug in, and, and that becomes a question. So if somebody is resistant to 100 milligrams, do you go to 200 milligrams or do you go to 400 milligrams? And there really is no evidence saying one is better than the other. We just know that um, if you get, when you, when you get sub-inhibitory concentrations of fluconazole, you can actually increase the virulence and it actually causes a problem. Um, this is actually an example of azole resistant candida glabrata. It is probably the most problematic species of candida that we're seeing. Um, uh, glabrata is actually resistant to uh, azoles, it's, but it does respond to voriconazole to a degree. This is the most common non-albican species that we're seeing in the mouth today, and the um, presentation is different, as you can tell. So I think I might have been stuck for a second, so I'm going to go back and just show you. This is azole-resistant um, albicans, and this is azole-resistant glabrata. So that was everything that um, I wanted to talk to you about candidiasis, so please um, type in some questions there. I think the key is the treatment is two weeks based your treatment on the extent of disease. If there's a problem with having um, someone do something five times a day, then you can go to the, the, the systemic medication, but use it with care since we do have um, issues with people becoming resistant. This is actually what I refer to as the other white meat or oral hairy leukoplakia. It's a white lesion that shows up on the lateral border of the tongue. It does not wipe away. It's related to the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, is the fluconazole treatment off-label? Fluconazole treatment is on-label. That's what it's, uh, how it's uh, written for. Um, none of this is off-label. Um, it's a white lesion, lateral border of the tongue that um, <clears throat> will not wipe away. It shouldn't really be biopsied. It doesn't present in patients who have undetectable viral load. This is actually what it appeared like, as I would say, back in the day. Or for somebody who has not been in care and they show up with a very low CD4 count, you still might see this white corrugated lesion lateral borders of the tongue, but this is more like what we see today. Uh, there really is no treatment other than getting them on a good antiretroviral regimen. You can use high dose of acyclovir. Uh, it will lessen the symptoms, but the lesion will come back. As far as periodontal diseases, I'm actually just going to talk about the most severe diseases to start with. This is something called necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis. It's a marker of severe immune deterioration. Uh, patients, as this slide will say, will have strong halitosis, which is a nice way of saying a fetid odor. It, it has a very awful smell. They might complain of spontaneous bleeding, deep jaw pain. Um, patients are very uncomfortable and what's, uh, and it's, as I said, it's a marker of severe immune deterioration. So not only do you see the gingival tissues begin to erode away, where that red area and that, that you see the root of the tooth there, but the actual bone that holds the teeth in the mouth erodes away very quickly. Treatment for this would involve using 
An appropriate antibiotic, something such as metronidazole at 500 milligrams, you could do that uh, t uh, three times a day for seven to 10 days. If you're afraid they, they're not gonna not be able to drink alcohol with metronidazole, you could write clindamycin or augmentin, either one of those would work. Pain management is very important. Nutritional supplementation is very important. Um, we work with both of those. Uh, chlorhexidine mouth rinses are also very important to use. Um, Paradex or Perigard, or one of the Perigard actually tastes better, which is what I use. Uh, so that's actually, if you see that, that's a significant addition. And that's where interactions between the dental team and the primary care team, which the dental team is a part of, are remarkably important. Just because someone has HIV doesn't mean they can't present with routine um, periodontal conditions because uh, gingivitis and periodontal disease. So I'm going to go over uh, another case that's a little bit complex, so you're going to have to stay up with me here. A 28-year-old male needs comprehensive dental care, including some extractions, really deep cleaning, and multiple fillings. And his medical history had pneumocystis pneumonia two years ago. He had a community-acquired pneumonia two months ago. And he has a moderate case of pseudomembranous candidiasis. Here are his labs. He has a very low CD4 count, a very high viral load. You can see his hemoglobin, uh, platelet count, and, excuse me, an absolute neutrophil count. So here are your questions, and this is not an easy one. So uh, you want to get medical clearance, or someone has contacted you for medical clearance. Which of these following statements are true? Okie dokie. Um, A, any HIV-infected person with a CD4 count less than 100 should be pre-medicated prior to invasive dental pr procedures to prevent a bacterial septicemia. B. The candidiasis should be treated prior to initiating dental therapy to prevent a fungal septicemia. C. The decision to grant clearance should be based on the individual's ability to withstand invasive dental procedures and on pertinent lab values such as platelet count, INR if they're on Coumadin, absolute neutral count, and glucose. CD4 count and viral load do not have an impact on dental care. And just to confuse you even further, whoops, we know we did, we changed it to those three. So which of these following statements is true? Is the following A, somebody has a really low CD4 count, you need to pre-medicate the patient prior to treatment. B, you really need to treat the candidate so to prevent a fungal septicemia. Or C, the decision to grant clearance is based on other labs, not necessarily C4 count and viral load. So let's see how we're doing. We have three people, four people that are saying, how about no vote? There's a no vote there? Who knew? Um, okay, let's see. I should be doing ding, ding, ding to give you a little time limit here. We still have some shy people. We have 13 votes, 20 people on. We'll call the question. A is the wrong answer. There is no reason to premedicate based on CD4 counts. So I, I really want to make that. Uh, there's, there was something in a textbook years ago that said you needed to premedicate if the CD4 count was less than 200. Um, I actually ran, I did a lecture at the University of Minnesota last year and talked to the author. The new book is coming out, and that's actually out of the book. We realize there's no reason to premedicate for oral surgery based on CD4 count or viral load or any of the HIV labs. Uh, you don't need to treat candidiasis prior to doing uh, a dental extraction. You would want to get the tooth out, the person out of pain. And the six people did get it right. You really have to look at what labs are um, pertinent in here. And we'll try to talk about them a little bit. I'm considered an expert in HIV dental care, and I always love to slay this slide. Um, Evidence-based research shows that what I do in the dental office is no different than any other dentist does in the United States. So it's, it's, we just don't do anything differently. And this is an evidence-based report that was put on by the NIDCR. Uh, there was a publication in 1994, which before we had combination therapies um, by two colleagues of mine, Michael Glick and Steve Abel. They looked at 331 patients, 18 invasive procedures. The post-procedural com complication rate was 17, the, I mean 17 complications of a rate of 0.9. The incidence of post-procedural complications is no greater than any other population. This is before HIV was a chronic disease. This was when we had, um, and, and you saw the average CD4 count was 71, so it's a very low CD4 count. So we don't recommend premedicating based on the fact that someone has HIV or AIDS. So our important lab valleys. I have three that I've listed here so far. CD4 count, there's no need to premedicate. 
Um, this was put together by the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Oral Medicine. They are the gold standard. Viral load is no reason to premedicate based on a high viral load. Platelet count is an important one to know. The platelet count must be 60,000 or higher. I sort of always find this interesting because if you look at the recommendations for oncology patients, that number is 50,000. Is there any reason that that should be different? And this is only an opinion because what I have in front of you is published data. There is actually no difference. Here is your question number three, and then I think everyone can relax. A patient has a history of atrial fibrillation. It's successfully managed with five milligrams of warfarin a day. So someone asked me about warfarin earlier. The patient is needing a full mouth abridement, which means they haven't had their teeth cleaned in a long time. There's going to be some bleeding. Um, it's just not your normal, you've been every six months kind of cleaning. It's a deep cleaning. Which of the following statements is true? No alteration of anticoagulation is necessary for an INR that is in the therapeutic range, which is two to three, given that local hemostatic measures are used, or B, the patient should stop taking warfarin two to three days prior to the dental appointment.